Thanks for everyone for Got it. Go ahead and accept that. Thanks for remembering. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Candace Davis. I'm on the leadership team of Indivisible Evanston, and I'm a co-leader of the Truth Brigade Illinois group. And Indivisible Evanston and Truth Brigade Illinois, along with Indivisible Illinois and Indivisible Western Front, are co-hosting this meeting on fighting disinformation with effective messaging. We're really excited to present tonight's program which includes a presentation on effective communication by Anant Schenker Osorio. She will be presenting first. Then we will have a presentation about Truth Brigade Illinois and a presentation on the Talk Radio Project. We'll be ending at nine o'clock central. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. We'll try to get to the questions. Our agenda is pretty packed, but uh, if we can, we will. Uh, this program is being recorded as you just saw, and we will make it available after the meeting. Um, we're also going to save the chat and we're going to share that with you so you'll be able to have any links or information that's shared in the chat. You don't need to be writing things down. And we're also going to send you the slides um, from Truth Brigade Illinois and we'll send those things out in the next couple of days. So I just, I'm with Indivisible Evanston and I'm just, we're very proud to be part of the Indivisible National Grassroots Movement. Uh, if you want more information on us and our activities, Indivisible Evanston's, Check it out at our website, indivisibleevanston.com. Um, Edit Worthington is going to talk for a moment about Indivisible Western Front and Truth Brigade Illinois. And Rose Colasino is going to talk about Indivisible Illinois, and she will introduce our amazing guest speaker. So, Edda, take it away. Hi, everybody. Glad to see you. And I hope you notice in the background what's there. Yes. Uh, so we definitely are about making lying wrong again. I'm head of uh, and founder of Western Front Indivisible, and we're a little different than Indivisible Evanston because we don't have one community we're in. We're in the Western suburbs, and we have people from Forest Park, Oak Park, River Forest, Irwin, um, Elmwood Park, a couple other places. And uh, we meet regularly, including a happy hour, and I've become a really good uh, mixologist. We do it online, so, you know. I'm the only one that drinks. But, but besides that, uh, we have an action list that goes out every day, every day, every week. And we try and provide opportunities for people uh, to find ways to make a difference. Now, Truth Brigade is um, it's a small but growing army of people that are countering the disinformation that's just rampant online on social media. You all know about it. You see it all the time. Um, and we, we're doing that by focusing on specific issues and we have a specific methodology that we use because the way we're approaching this, um, we're trying to tell the truth in a way that will help people decide to change your mind. We can't change them, but we can help them decide they'll change your mind. So that's Truth Brigade and Rose. Great. Thank you so much, Candace. Thank you, Etta. So happy to be here this evening. So uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to you. My name is Rose Colasino, and I'm the co-coordinator of Indivisible Illinois, the Voters' Rights and Protection Lead, and the co-lead of Indivisible Illinois Social Justice Alliance. We are thrilled, thrilled that you are all here this evening. Messaging is mission critical to success in 2022, so you made a very good decision to be here tonight. This is the second event of the year for Indivisible Illinois Community Collaborative. I hope you can join us next week too as we focus on USPS and we welcome Porter McConnell of Save the Post Office and my rep, US Congressman Mike Quigley. Let me tell you a little more if I could about Indivisible Illinois. We work together to organize grassroots activists in order to win on progressive issues and to keep our state and US elections blue. The weekly statewide call provides the opportunity to connect with grassroots activists. We organize and mobilize the Indivisible Illinois community and grow grassroots power. So we hope to see you each and every Wednesday night at uh, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. As the next five days are so very important to our freedom to vote, please take the time, if you could, to call our senators once again and the constituents of Senators Cinema and Manchin to push for voting rights bills and the necessary change in the filibuster. I was on the Freedom Rising call earlier today, and uh, that advice came right from uh, Schumer. So uh, I hope that's something that we can all do. Also, the White House. Call there, too, as President Biden is expected to attend the Senate Democrats caucus launch to discuss voting rights and rule changes. Your actions are having an impact. Let's keep going. 
Last Indivisible National is organizing a weekend of action for MLK Day. The MLK team tells us, and I love this, no celebration without legislation. Ezra Levin, co-founder of Indivisible National, tells us that the vote might be on MLK Day. It is now my absolute pleasure, can't tell you how excited I am, to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Anat Shankar Osorio, a messaging and communications expert. Her talk tonight will focus on the best ways to fight disinformation and will also address why certain messages falter where others deliver. Anat co-leads bi-monthly Freedom Rising briefings, training us on critical messaging, such as freedom to vote, freedom to learn, and fair districting. Highly, highly recommended. I've been attending since almost the beginning, and as I said, I was there today. Anat is the host of the Words to Win by podcast and principal of ASO Communications. Her podcast unpacks how narrative shifts lead to victories. So far, I've listened to, and I'm keeping track, all in Wisconsin, Operation Libra, which just happens to be by dad's name, uh, defeating the far right, and our work is not done and will be listening, I assure you, to all of them. Anat has led research on into how to persuade and mobilize and issues ranging from unions, the race class narrative, promoting clean energy, honor, honoring immigrant rights and reforming the criminal justice system. Anat's empirical research has led to progressive electoral and policy victories across the globe. She delivers her findings, very necessary, packed in much needed humor to venues such as the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the Center for Australian Progress, the Irish Migrant Center, the Ford Foundation, and so much more. We don't have time to list them all. Her writing and research are profiled in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Boston Globe, Salon, and The Guardian. And that has appeared on MSNBC, including The Last Word. I understand from earlier that she was on today, so she's a busy woman. She is the author of Don't Buy It, The Trouble with Talking Nonsense About the Economy. If there is time, and we hope there is, and that will answer questions, please do pay, place your questions in the chat. We are very fortunate to have her here this evening. And that over to you. Thank you. I just moved because it was very dark where I was. The bulb burned out. You see, it's very fancy here. Um, I just need to be co-host so that I can share my screen. Yeah. Uh, while that's happening, I will tell you that I am honored to be with you. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm originally actually from Wisconsin. I don't know if that means you'll hold it against me, but hopefully not. I'm glad. I'm glad Wisconsin passes muster. I'm certainly. And I'm just waiting to be able to share screen. Yeah. Sorry, I am trying to find. Okay, here we go. Oh, I see. There you are. You're Liz Brown. Oh my gosh. Why am I listed? I'm so sorry. Okay. Let me change my name. What oh, a weird. I will. Um, that's my colleague. <laughs> there we go. All right. Hold on. Let me make you a co-host. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't mean to make your life hard. It's all right. As long as I can find you. There you are. I just changed my name. All right. Hold on. And you just disappeared, but that's okay. I will find yeah. you. Okay. What? More? You are now a co-host. Yay. Yay, the power. Okay. Sorry. Um, huh. Are you sure? It says host disabled participant screen sharing, but that shouldn't apply if I'm really a co-host. Not I'm sorry, that. folks. Bear with us. Yeah, always. There we go. Enable that. Oh, yay. There it is. Now the power's on. No. Again? No, can't. Oh, there. Oh. Okay. Did that work? Okay, now I'm a co host. Okay. I see the power. I All right. We got it. We're going to make it happen. Um, awesome. Okay. So first of all, I am just thrilled that the name of your combating in um, the, your approach to combating disinformation is all around having a truth brigade because that is extraordinary and exceptional. And I'm very, very happy that that is the approach that you're taking and the framing that you're using because this little talk CETO, which I will do quickly so we can get to questions um, is very much about telling our truths. 
because it turns out that just as nature abhors a vacuum, so too does knowledge, information, facts, words, messages. Whenever we do not say what our side is, that simply creates more room for lies, misinformation, disinformation, um, deliberate propaganda, and so on, whatever you want to call it, to get inside. And so we need to fill that space. That's why the number one principle, not just in messaging, but also in the more specific realm of combating disinformation is actually say what you're for. I often like to joke that if the left had written the story of David, it would be a biography of Goliath because what we like to do is talk about our opposition all of the time. We do this in many different ways. The classic one is through negation. So vaccines do not cause whatever, the latest thing is that they supposedly cause, right? Uh, there are billboards, someone sent me an image of a billboard that said, vaccines do not make you magnetic with a child and a giant magnet. I was like, well, good thing they don't make you magnetic. That's not what that poster is indicating to me at all. We are not teaching critical race theory in K-12. Crime rates have not risen in the last year. There was no fraud in this election right? On and on and on. And what we know from assertions like this is that through research, people recall the assertion, but they cannot remember whether it was true or false. Because what this does is it it exacerbates what we call the illusory truth effect. The illusory truth effect is cognitive bias that all of us are susceptible to, some more than others, where a thing that feels familiar to us feels true. And that is because what it does is it creates what we call cognitive ease. It's a bit like hearing da, 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 and your brain automatically goes da, da, because you are poised to complete that sentence. And so when they have already put loaded terms together like election and fraud, crime rate and rising, law and order, critical race theory, K-12. When we go to negate that, what folks actually hear is just a reinstantiation of what they've been hearing all along. So thing one, thing two, thing three, say what you're for, say what you're for, say what you're for. So what does that mean? In lieu of saying we are not teaching critical race theory in K-12, you say, we teach an accurate, honest curriculum in K-12 that includes the errors of our past and the challenges of our present. You say what you do teach. You say what is happening, not what is not. This is an example from work um, that I was part of in Australia. Classic negation 2013 before we did the research seeking asylum is not illegal. Learn the facts and show your support. Because clearly the reason why the government of Australia was shunting people to offshore prisons was because they didn't know the facts. That is not true. That is sarcasm. 2015, harms and horrors, where a lot of the immigrant rights debate is in the US right now, showing this child locked up, in you know bad way, the only developed country in the world that locks up children seeking asylum. The US now has this title, Australia, fortunately, we actually were successful, this is no longer true. To 2016, where we shifted after the research that was done at the end of 2015, and here you see Amir, who at the time of this photo actually was in a detention camp. He just doesn't appear to be. I'm happy to say he no longer is. I wanna be a human rights lawyer. There are people on this planet you can help by doing simple things with the affirmative demand, bring them here. It can feel, I understand, like there is no affirmative demand to make in almost every situation that we are confronting. But I would challenge you to recognize that there always is. Here is an example. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Me alegras es así. You never know, dear, how much I love you. Nunca quitas mi cielo de mí. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamt I held you in my arms. Les prepararme lo que tenía. Escondí mi cabeza y lloré. Please don't take my sunshine away.
I've tested it many times. Don't do this, stop that, end this. There is no comparison with all of that and saying we can create a fair immigration process that respects all families. We need to be making affirmative demands. When we make negative demands, we are actually reinforcing our opposition and we put ourselves in the position of, a sense of potentially being a victim of our own success. So in California, for example, where I live now, there was a very success, there was a successful, very hard fought movement to quote, end cash bail. So the state of California ended cash bail by prolonging pretrial detention. And when the advocates who had succeeded in quote, ending cash bail were like WTF, the lawmakers who had been swung around and were initially on the fence were like, what do you mean? You told us to end cash bail, that's what we did. But that isn't what those folks actually meant. When you have a negative demand, you risk being upset when you quote unquote win. Again, it can feel like there is no affirmation to make, but again, I would posit to you that there always is. This is from an example, this is an example from the 2020 campaign that we utilized in our messaging and in our digital ad program in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. This is also an illustration, and so is the previous ad, of the principle of shifting away from sympathy toward empathy. Anytime we are attempting sympathy, i.e. making people feel sorry for those people, whoever those people are, could be people seeking asylum, could be Black people, could be people who are experiencing homelessness. Anytime you are attempting to make people feel sorry for those people, you are still engaged in othering by definition. What we need instead to do is to create empathy, to have people understand what that actually would feel like if they were to experience it themselves. Inherent in the kind of research that I do and certainly in the kind of messaging and ads that I create is that we shouldn't force people to perform their pain for us as a condition of accepting their humanity. And that is just a sort of baseline starting point. So if we want to be able to combat disinformation, we need to flood the zone with what is true and what we are for. The next principle is that order matters. Messages that are when we test them, the same three sentences in a different order actually create a very different effect. So here's an example of an ad in the correct order, and then I will explain what that is. So that is not that different than I don't know how many COVID ads that aired in the cycle, but the fundamental distinction is that rather than beginning with the bad stuff, which happens in the middle bit, it begins by showing everyday people standing with and for each other, doing the right thing, delivering food, wearing their masks, creating mutual aid, doing their jobs, et cetera, et cetera, pulling through this pandemic by pulling together. What we find is that if we go straight into the problem, if we go straight into the, this is how the administration is utterly failing us, this is what is terrible and horrible. What I like to call, boy, have I got a problem for you messaging, or this is the Titanic, would you like to buy a ticket? It's not that people don't believe that, it's that it unleashes the cynicism that gets in the way of their desire to act. And a lot of the time, what we see in our research is not that our issue is that people don't think our ideas are right, it's that they don't think our ideas are possible. So why bother? And that is why, just like we have this truth sandwich, there is a fundamental order to messages that work. So I know that you're familiar with the sandwich. Um, 
This sandwich is, of course, about how we debunk disinformation. We want to say what's true. We want to call out the lie without repeating it and ascribe motivation behind it. I'll give you an illustration, and then we want to say what's true. Two times as much truth as any mention of the lie. So what does this look like in practice? Let's say the lie is, and we can practice this in Q&A as well. Let's say the lie is, uh, you know, the election was rife with fraud and there was bags of mail found in Southern Illinois, who knows what, yeah? Something like that. So what do you do? You say what's true. This was the most scrutinized, recounted and observed election in US history and trusted election administrators in our state and across our country have found this to be an absolutely validated election and that the votes were correctly counted. Then we wanna call out what the other side is saying without repeating the lie. A handful of politicians, and we wanna ascribe motivation, who are determined to seize and hold power want to spread lies about this election, hoping to distract us from their failures to govern in our name. And then you want to say what's true. We turned out in record numbers, our votes were counted, they were recounted, and they were validated, and the will of the people has prevailed. So you want to say what's true, you want to indicate that they've lied without repeating what their lie is, and say why they've done it, and then you want to say what's true. This overall structure for messages is also true even if you're not debunking disinformation. You want to lead with a shared value, lead with a positive like that COVID ad, then you want to name the problem second, and then you want to close with an affirmation. So values, villain, vision is sometimes how we talk about this. Principle number three, politics isn't solitaire. Unfortunately, we do not exist in a world where folks only hear from us. That would be real nice. I think all of us would be sipping Mai Tais or doing whatever it is we would want to be doing on a Wednesday evening, not on a Zoom call. But in point of fact, what we know is that the right wing is engaged in unrelenting, never-ending, very oft-repeated race baiting, right? This has been their strategy since forever, at least arguably since Nixon deployed it as the quote-unquote Southern strategy. It is in some ways the oldest trick in the political book, divide in order to conquer, create some sort of them, some sort of other, so that we don't see that the actual source of our pain is the wealthy and powerful few essentially taking from us. This is, these are some curated examples of this, but the examples are essentially endless. For far too long, the approach of the left to dealing with this has been, oh, we just won't talk about race. Or we just won't talk about those cultural issues. Or we just won't talk about quote unquote identity politics or whatever the name du jour is. Even if all you want is to be strategic, even without the moral reality that a progressive agenda includes liberty and justice for all, and therefore if we are not attending to questions of immigrant rights, to questions of every single one of us being able to get home safe without worrying about what police will do to us along the way, even if you don't care about that, just from the vantage point of strategy and winning, not talking about race is not an option because if we are silent about race, the only thing the other side hears is the unrelenting race baiting of our opposition. And therefore our economic promise can't get through. This is where something some of you will be familiar with enters into the picture. We call it the race class narrative. This is an example from some of the research that we've done. We've researched this a lot extensively on how being forthright about race in this case, bests right-wing economic populism. So in a forced choice scenario in which the opposition says to make life better for working people, we need to cut taxes, reduce regulations, get government out of the way. When we rebut that with the statement in green to make life better for working people, we need to invest in education, create better paying jobs, et cetera, we win, right? We win handily with the base, we win handily with persuadables. When we make explicit mention of race, we win by even more, that's the statement in blue. 
when we are trying to combat their anti-immigrant xenophobic race baiting, again, the statement in red, we need elected leaders who will keep us safe from terrorists, secure our borders, prevent illegal immigrants, et cetera. When we attempt to rebut that with a message that does not explicitly name race in green, we are underwater with persuadables in a national sample of voters. We flip from being three points under to being seven points over when we explicitly name race and are calling out, of course, their divide and conquer tactics. So what is the race class narrative? It has a the same architecture, the values villain vision. It just has some more meat on those bones. It opens with a shared value and that shared value explicitly names race and class or at least alludes to it. It then names deliberate division or scapegoating, the problem second, the villain second, as a weapon that abets economic harm to all. It then resolves that tension created between the value and the villain by emphasizing unity and collective action. And ideally there is some sort of call to action. So how does that look like in practice? This is an example from sort of one of the original race class narrative ads that we did as part of a broader campaign in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we know long winters and we know how to dig our neighbors out of the snow. Cause whether it's our first Minnesota winter or our 50th, we've all been there. So when certain politicians want to divide us and make us afraid, we know that means they've got nothing else to offer. We're on to them. There are lots of ways to be Minnesotan, and all of them are greater than fear. In Minnesota, we're better off together. Vote greater than fear between now and November 6th. And a more recent example from 2020, see if you can challenge yourself to find the values villain vision. We, we want our communities to be healthy and vibrant. And so we march together. together to demand justice. While a handful of politicians try to make us fear each other. We're onto them and we count on us. us. And so we turn up and we turn out as voters. To make this a place where liberty and justice are for all. For all. For all. Para todos. Vote. And finally, you have to break a signal through the noise. That's one of the hardest things that we have. So Miracle Whip Craft Foods spends 95 cents of every one of its advertising dollars on the people it calls its super heavy users. These are people who always buy Miracle Whip, only buy Miracle Whip, can be relied upon to purchase Miracle Whip in perpetuity. If we were together, I would let you, you would actually talk. This would not be a rhetorical question. Why would you spend so much money on the people that you already have? If I open the chat, I'll get too distracted. So I will just tell you the answer. The answer is because in marketing parlance, these people are your brand advocates. They are the people who, forgive the pun, will spread the gospel of Miracle Whip by making a chocolate cake, bringing it to the family reunion. People eat it and are like, this is moist and delicious. What's in it? Would you believe Miracle Whip? That's disgusting, but I'm strangely intrigued. Because if Miracle Whip were to tell you, put some put this in your cake, you'd be like, no, that's not going to happen. But if your friend already fed it to you, then maybe you would be open to it. This story, by the way, comes to me by way of an incredible strategist campaigner, Erica Payne. Because what Madison Avenue and the right wing understands is that a message is like a baton that has to be passed from person to person to person. And if it gets dropped anywhere along the way, it is by definition not persuasive. A message that the people don't hear does not persuade them. And so first and foremost, what a message needs to do is it needs to move our base from agreement where they begin, because that's how we define our base, to repetition. It has to be a thing that people want to say over and over again. And then it has to persuade the conflicted middle. What we see in research about these conflicted folks is that by definition, they are non-ideological. If they were, they wouldn't be in the middle. They would be us or they would be the opposition. They would have a viewpoint. And these are folks who are especially susceptible to 
different kinds of cognitive biases, including what I said earlier, the feeling that something that has they've heard a lot that sounds familiar must be true. This is all the more reason why we need our base repeating, repeating, repeating the same few things. And then we need to recognize that there are going to be some people who cannot, shall not, will not, will never agree with us. And that's our opposition. If your opposition likes what you're saying, what are you saying? <laughs> you're either saying nothing, right? You're saying puppies are cute, which is fine, but it doesn't advance a political argument, or you are inadvertently reinforcing your opposition's argument. So again, from that Minnesota example, how do you break a signal through the noise? By creating a campaign that is the same overarching thing repeated over and over and over. In this case, greater than fear. So you saw it in the ad, you see it in these posters. It was also an organizing campaign. Obviously this was pre-COVID. These are folks in their long sleeved greater than fear shirts from Unidos, from the Somali Worker Center, from SEIU Minnesota, from the teachers union, from all the different kinds of groups, all agreeing to sing from the same songbook and carry this message of greater than fear rather than their individuated organizational message. Same is true across social media. When Trump came to Rochester, Minnesota, instead of having an anti-Trump rally, we had a greater than fear rally. We did this again in 2020 across a family of brands in the Midwest, obviously, especially focused in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And we did this again, as many of you know, in the post-election period by unrelentingly saying, count every vote, count every vote, count every vote, count every vote. We didn't say they're claiming fraud and there is no fraud. It's a coup and they're attempting a coup. Trump is saying all of these things. Let's repeat them over and over in an attempt to negate them. We said, count every vote, count every vote, count every vote. And then we said, voters decided, voters decided, voters decided. And we did that enough and we were simple and repetitive enough that that is what broke through. And that is in fact, the way that we combat disinformation. So I will stop there. I want to start by thanking you, Anat. I uh, would like to replicate you. I wish we had thousands of you, but hopefully you can train us. I know I've attended, as I said, a lot of your trainings and I really, um, really would like everyone to do the same, show up for Freedom Rising and show up for um, Anat's podcast, but uh, we are so, so grateful. And I see all the questions coming up in the chat. I will now turn it over to Candace, who I believe is going to be leading the Q&A. Yes, we've got several questions. I guess I get to ask my own first, which is what message should we be pushing now? What do you think is the most important message? I mean, obviously freedom to vote, right but but overarching what would you say where where should we be pushing yeah um i mean that's a hard thing to answer in the abstract because it depends on whether you mean specifically in your state whether you're trying to get one specific thing done but you asked me about an overarching message and and so i will answer that right now Social proof is real. Social proof is essentially the phenomenon wherein people do the thing they think people like them do. And so we know, for example, that when we say to people, XYZ identity group isn't really voting, like turnout is low among young people, or Latinos don't really vote, or name category group doesn't really vote in midterm elections, that that actually decreases voting. And so right now, there's a ton of discourse about how people are checked out, people are tuned out, people are not paying attention to politics, people are turning away, people are disengaged, all this stuff. I'm sure you've heard it. It's something that keeps me up at night. I'm sure it keeps all of you up at night, etc. That's an indoor voices kind of thing to say. We don't need to be telling people that that's how people feel. Because when we tell people that, <laughs> then that actually creates social proof. And in a sense, it kind of creates social permission. 
What we want is to restore where we were in 2018, 2020, obviously not with Trump, I don't mean that, but I mean restore in the sense of politics being kind of must-see TV, meaning politics was a thing that most people, way more people were engaged in, were interested in, were talking about. People were doing selfie the vote, right? There was this sort of giant socially sanctioned feeling that being involved in politics, I mean, it's what gave birth to Indivisible, so I don't need to tell anybody on this call. So I would say that the overarching message right now, when we're not talking about a specific policy fight or in a specific state context, is basically, yes, we can, because yes, we did. We turned out in record numbers. We made sure every vote was counted and that the will of the people prevailed, and we will do it again. And if the other side thinks they're going to stop us, they got another thing coming. Basically, we got this. We're doing this. We did it before and we're doing it again. It's a fake it till you make it kind of moment. I like it. I like it. Um, here's a more specific question, which is please give your evaluation of the House January 6th committee's actions from your messaging perspective. Gosh. Um, that's hard because, you know, there's so many people in that committee that, you know, I think that there's been some really incredible discourse. I think that Jamie Raskin is often an incredible um, orator on this. I think that they're in an incredibly challenging position, but I think that, you know, the main thing to the extent that this is what's been conveyed, and that's the question, right, really what's come across, not so much what have they said, because I would love to live in a world in which what people think about Democrats is made out of what Democrats say. That would be a lovely reality. It doesn't happen to be our reality. <laughs> what people think about Democrats is not made out of what Democrats say. It's made partly out of that, but it's also made by what is said about them, what's in the media, etc. So I would say that what needs to be conveyed about January 6th is that January 6th was an attack on us. It was an attack on our nation as opposed to it was an attack on our capital or an attack on our government. People need to feel that it was sort of personally against them, even if they live, you know, in Illinois or in California or wherever far away from DC. Number one. Number two, they need to feel that that attack was absolutely created by the lies that were spread and the deliberate propaganda from the MAGA faction. And as important, they need to feel that just as we have this negative, angry, ugly, divisive force, we have always had Americans of good conscience who have come together across race and place to leave a legacy that we, to, to create a legacy that we're proud to leave our children. That this has been the sort of dueling force of our nation since its founding, and that we are the inheritors of an incredible legacy and therefore an incredible responsibility. And it will not be on our watch that this MAGA faction will prevail. We dealt a serious blow to fascism with ballots, not bullets, and we're doing it again. Okay. Um, here's a good question right down your alley. What, what are some of the best ways to sell the brownie, not the recipe when it comes to voting rights? Yeah. So thank you for that reference. Um, for folks who don't know that reference, basically that's just the idea that we don't really want to take our policy out in public. Uh, we don't want our policy to be our message. We want the outcome of our policy to be our message. So in terms of voting rights, that is hard because voting is a means to a thing, right? It's the way that we get the kinds of policies that we can translate into brownies. And so the way that I would talk about it is making this a place where every single one of our voices is heard or um, making sure that every single one of us has equal say in the decisions that impact our lives ensuring we can elect leaders who govern in our name and enact our priorities, protecting our freedom, including the most fundamental freedom we have, which is our vote. And this is somewhat related, you know, how do we 
advocate for voting rights that are in danger without making people feel their votes won't matter in 2022 if the reform doesn't pass. How yeah. do you get, where do you get the brownies on that one? Yeah, that's tough and, and an incredibly good question because we do need, even in a state like say Arizona or Georgia or Texas, et cetera, folks still need to turn out, right? They need to not feel like whatever, it doesn't even matter the things going in the garbage, why would I bother waiting in a whatever hour line? So I think that what we have to say it's tough and it, it's sort of context dependent. You know, I would give one answer now. I will just openly tell you, I'll give a different answer in August, September. The answer is going to differ because the theory of change and the need is going to be different, right? Um, so right now, the answer, the January answer that I'm giving is that they're trying to take away our freedom to vote, or they're trying to take away the freedom to vote of these communities so they can rule only for the wealthy and powerful few. And we need our senators to exercise their majority to protect our freedom to vote and to make sure that our decisions governing our lives are in the hands of every single one of us, no exceptions. So they're trying to take away our freedom to vote is what I would say, and we need to protect it. Okay, okay. As opposed um, to they already have, for example. Right, right. So keep keep fighting because it's not a done deal, yeah. Um, Rose asked an excellent question. She said, you know, we're working on reaching disenfranchised and discouraged voters. And you know, we, they talk, you talked on the Freedom Rising briefing this afternoon, they touched on it, but what are your top tips for um, reaching that group of people? Yeah. So that is hard. That is something that you probably heard on lots of our briefings, including um, the one that I was not on today. I'm hoping that everybody thinks that Chuck Schumer and I are actually the same person because we're never. <laughs> well, people were worried about your health, so I were they they were worried with if you weren't there that there was something really wrong. They said, "No, no, she's on TV." <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Uh, sorry, I, I distracted myself with my Chuck Schumer joke. Um, <laughs> uh, so ask me again. Um, it, what, um, when we're talking about reaching the disenfranchised and discouraged yeah. voters, yeah. what's the, what's the top tips for getting yeah. to that? So my top tips there, um, and actually I'm sort of tempted if you want, um, if you want, I will answer that even though we're at time, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then I will not show yeah. you. Um, I was gonna show you two sort of very concrete things about mobilization, so I will just talk about them. Um, basically, there's kind of two psychographic groups that we find are um, what are technically referred to as low propensity voters. I refuse to call them low propensity voters. I call them high potential voters because mm -hmm. we make our own reality. You do not want to reference people as low propensity or unlikely or God forbid non-voters. No one is a non-voter. They're simply a voter we have not convinced yet. So do not call people those things. When we are talking about our high potential voters, which is different than the category of people that I've now named our vital voters, our vital voters are our new 2020 voters. So they've done it at least once. In some cases, they did 18 and 20. I call those people vital voters, the new surge voters. High potential voters are, they've never done it, okay? So it depends who you're talking to, but basically, the first rule of thumb is that we want to evoke identity. So we know from experimentation that the seemingly facile distinction between will you be a voter and will you vote actually makes a measurable difference. And asking people to be a voter and getting them to pledge, yes, I will be a voter, getting people to adopt that as an identity increases the likelihood they will actually take the action. We need to remember that vote is a verb. It's an action people take. It's not just a belief that they have. And a lot of voting, believe it or not, is really a matter of habituation. And so interventions around voting that have to do with let's experiment with talking about a different issue or let's experiment with talking about a different candidate. 
actually the most consistent thing that moves the needle at all, and we're talking about moving it inches, right? But politics is a game of inches, centimeters, millimeters, is actually just talking to people about being a voter and having this identity. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, a lot of what keeps people from voting is understandably cynicism, a feeling, especially right now, like, what is the point? I did turn out. I did the thing you said. You said this was the most important election of our lifetimes, blah, 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 blah. You said that last time too. And like, what is it getting me? What are we getting? So if we, if we look at that, and, and I don't have an easy answer here. These are all real things that we're struggling with and we're looking at in the research. We still want to place our target audience in the role of agent. So rather than saying Democrats delivered or the people that we elected delivered this, you want to say to them, in 2020, we turned out in record numbers. It's thanks to you or it's thanks to people in your community or it's thanks to people like you that we got stimulus checks, we cut child poverty in half, we are repairing our roads and we are rebuilding our bridges and that's because of voters like you. But you know what, our work is not done yet, which is a message we used in um, the Georgia runoffs, right? They had just voted and they came straight back to them and said, our work is not done yet. So a message that centers the voter as the agent rather than centering the politician that we are voting for as the agent. You did this. Third, defiance. So this idea that we turned out in record numbers and now they are trying to take away our freedoms and silence our voices. And if they think that's happening on our watch, they've got another thing coming. So to the extent that you're playing in the terrain of negative emotion, which we need to do sometimes, you want to stay on the side of anger and defiance and not on the side of fear and threat. Because fear is an inhibiting emotion. You want to piss people off. You don't want to freak them out. Got it. Yep. Um, and one last question. So I, I'm afraid I might know the answer. What do you say when people say Democrats are crappy at messaging? Uh, um, it depends who's saying, who's asking me, because it's again, like an indoor voice, outdoor voice kind of thing. To say that publicly, you know, to, to talk about that in the same way that I wouldn't say, you know, voter turnout is low or um, people are being really apathetic or, you know, the kinds of things that I would share on kind of a briefing as far as gathering information, providing information are different than what I would like say on stage. So it depends in what context I'm being asked. What I would say if I'm sort of on, like outdoor voice, if that analogy is making sense to you. Some of you must be parents, right? We know about indoor voices and outdoor voices. If I'm saying it in my outdoor voice, like I want people to hear it as a message, what I would say is that Democrats spend our time and attention on making this a place of liberty and justice for all, on creating good policies, on studying the recommendations of experts and scientists and health practitioners and epidemiologists. And so it's true, we can get into the weeds because we care so much and we're so interested in the details of the kinds of laws that we want for every single person in every family. And when you are selling a steaming pile of shit, you have to wrap it in layers and layers and layers of incredibly attractive, utterly untrue wrapping paper. The GOP has absolutely nothing to offer the American people and even they know it. And so they're required to spend all of their time and attention finding propaganda and lies. And so it's no wonder all of their focus is on messaging. They have nothing else to offer. Like that's my sort of I'm not gonna come out and say, you know, Democrats are shit at this. I'm gonna explain why they don't focus there 
and I'm going to explain why the GOP only focuses there. Well, I'm hoping you're working with Chuck on this. <laughs> well, we're the same person. That's why we weren't on the briefing. That's today. right. I should have known, should have known. Thank you so much. Um, this has been wonderful. And I do want to assure everybody it's recorded. We will make the recording available so you can go back and take notes. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to, we'll pass on all the messaging you can give us. We share the, the Freedom Rising briefings. We share your messages and we'll share it with this group too. So thank you so much for everything you do. We no, really thank it. you for having me. And thank you for all the work that you do. If your words don't spread, they don't work. There's no point in any of this research and content creation if people don't use it. And honestly, the real work is in the implementation. The coming up with the thing is something, but it's nothing if it doesn't go anywhere. So thank you. We're learning. We're learning and we're trying to spread. So thank you so much. Okay, take Everyone. care. Well, I think that was a great uh, intro for us. Don't you uh, think so, Ada? Absolutely. Um, you know, everything we have to say now about Truth Brigade really follows along right away. Um, for those of you that don't know, maybe you've arrived a little late, Truth Brigade was started by Indivisible National back in August of 2020. And I actually had the opportunity of going to the first session, which talked about it. And Candace, I have to tell you, it blew me away and it really changed how I was using stuff on social media. But why don't we talk about uh, what are the basic tenets, ideas behind the Truth Brigade? By the way, oh, before I say, before I tell you that, uh, do you know that now, since that time, we have had over 200 million, 208 million impressions on, and that means views on Twitter from posts that people connected to Truth Brigade have put out there. That's pretty impressive, I think. That's very impressive. Yeah, and we, what, we're, what we're trying to do is counter disinformation by not responding to it, but by putting um, our own truth out there. And I don't know about you, but I was so relieved when I found Truth Brigade because I spent so much time getting furious at the misinformation I saw on Facebook and elsewhere. And I would want to try to argue with people, but you know, there's people you just can't argue with. And you was just, I was just so angry all the time. And then I found Truth Brigade and the answer was, well, stop arguing with them. Just write them off. Just go out there and do your own truth. So that's what we've been in. And we've been using the methodology that um, pretty much, and it goes right along with everything that Anat said, which was, which is a relief to hear, including the true sandwich. So should I go ahead and-, and uh, Yeah, let's talk about uh, the basic rules or commandments. We made them commandments. What are right. the commandments, the five commandments? We made it less than you know the 10 commandments for being in a truth brigade. Can you see my screen? Um, you got all of them there. So okay, we don't want that one. I'm gonna stop share. Let me do this start again. again. <laughs> yeah, share screen. So we decided to, to get it down into only five basic ideas that you have to remember about what you need to do or not do because 10 seem to many, even though the 10 commandments were like, yeah. Is so, uh, are can you, you my screen? Can you get, you're not the slideshow yet. Yep, there we go. Here we go, slideshow, yeah. play from the start. I think we got it. Okay, the five commandments. Five commandments of truth telling. The first commandment, I think you've heard this before is do not amplify disinformation lies. Don't respond at all. Do not counter something when someone says um, they're telling something that's something completely ridiculous. What, whatever you do, don't answer. Because if you comment on it, you're spreading it. If you put an angry face on it, you're spreading it. It goes further up. And, and like Anat said, People remember the negative part. They're not going to analyze the fact that you put something in there that said, this isn't true. Here's an article about it. So if you can only remember one thing, don't 
fight back on misinformation, don't comment. If you're desperate to show somebody something, um, take a screenshot of it because even sharing it in a private message moves it up the ladder in terms of importance. So that's commandment one. Okay, and we, we're all paying attention to this, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook, because the algorithm says if people respond to it, then it shows it to more people. So we don't wanna make the lies go to more people. What else do we do, Candace? So then commandment two is spread the truth, make a new post, use a true sandwich, um, the same type of thing that Annette talked about. And there's a couple ways of looking at it. And she talked about this as well. Um, you can, your, your top layer is a shared truth um, and, or, and the best way to do that is to start with the value. The middle layer is the bad actor or the lie, call it out, that's your villain. Say, don't repeat what they're saying, just call out their bad intention and then end with the truth or a vision of how things should be. So that's both the true sandwich and what I call the values, billion, the three Vs, values, billions, and vision. So whichever way it's easier for you to remember, um, I think that's a good way to look at it. Okay, well, this sandwich looks pretty good. So what do we do next after that? Three, when you do do your true sandwich, always use links to credible news sources and or a graphic with your post because it turns out that the people pay attention to visual things. So your graphic will catch their eye. The article illustration will catch their eye. People just tend to skim past words. So make sure that you have an accurate source that you link when you're calling out their BS. Well, you know, this is a really good point. Back to the graphic. Um, I find that, you know, the, the more interesting the graphic I put out there with my post, the more response I get from people. And, um, you know, another interesting thing is when you post uh, a link for an article, it's going to pull up the graphic from that article. And you may have seen that. Um, so you won't have to find one necessarily if you're posting from like a, a New York Times article or, you know, wherever your article is coming from. So, okay, so we use links uh, or graph and make sure there's something graphic there. What else do we do? Commandment four, use your hashtags and post your truth on social media. So Instagram's great, Facebook is great, Twitter is great. Use the hashtag, hashtag Truth Brigade, which um, national, Invisible National tracks. And then we also, if you've got room on, sometimes I don't have room on Twitter to get Truth Brigade Illinois in there because I've run out of characters. But if you can, go ahead and use the hashtag Truth Brigade Illinois. And put all your truth is across social media as much as you can. Okay, so, um, you know, some people go, oh, I'm not on Twitter. And that's what I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, all this stuff on Twitter. Is it okay if I'm just on Facebook? Absolutely, absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, um, Facebook is one of the places that we're really trying to get to because so many people in the middle um, are on Facebook. And you might think, oh, people who I'm friends with are a lot like me. But if they were a lot like you, they'd be on this meeting. A lot of people are sort of in the middle. And when they hear something that makes them worry and they might go to the right. And if they hear something from you, you're probably somebody's trusted advisor or trusted source of information. And it's true that individuals listen to people they know and trust more than they do to public news sources. So even though you might think, what difference does it make if I send it out to my Facebook friends? It could be making a huge difference. So put it everywhere that you're on social media, but don't think that you don't make a difference because you do make a difference. And if you're like me, uh, I've got a lot of people from all uh, uh, decades of my life that follow me on Facebook. And, you know, so I have people from grade school and up to like just recent friends. Uh, so um, and I don't know where some of the people from grade, grade school are at. So I may have I may have had some influence on them. So what else do we do? OK, the last commandment, amplify other truth for Gators posts, even if you're the kind of person who doesn't want to 
try to figure this out and put your own post together. You can do a lot of good by passing the baton by just clicking like or commenting on somebody else's post when you see something that looks good. If you share it, that helps. If you comment on it, that gets more attention. Even if you like it, that helps move it up so that more people see it. So we want people to amplify other Truth Brigaders posts. And you can do that in Twitter. It's sim super simple. You just go in and put hashtag Truth Brigade and you find the tweets from those people and you can, you can simply retweet them. You can like them. You can retweet them with a comment um, or you can post your own, but just amplifying what's out there. That's how the word spread from person to person. So uh, Candace, if I am really busy and I just don't have time to make some posts, just liking some things, uh, just retweeting some things if I'm on, on uh, uh, Twitter, that's, that makes some difference, it right? It does make a difference. That's how we get the word out there. And then you'll find that, you know, more people um, spread it along. So it's really, um, it's amplifying other, other people's work. Could, you know, if that's all you do, that's fine. That's a great thing to do. Uh, but let, let's show them some examples of, yes. of how, how this is done. So the Anats group and, um, and Truth Brigade National puts out a bunch of wonderful graphics we use. So this is something that we pulled from one of their, this is a great graphic, Pass the Freedom to Vote Act. The message is, we start with our um, values. All voters should have the freedom to vote. Then our villain, but a handful of politicians want to put up barriers to silence our voices based on what we look like or where we live. Then the vision of the future. Together, we can ensure everyone has the hashtag freedom to vote. That's a hashtag on Twitter. Hashtag Truth Brigade, hashtag Truth Brigade Illinois. Um, so yeah, if you can fit that all yeah, in there, that's a great one. Similarly, on Facebook, Facebook gives you a little more room because it doesn't have a, a count limitation. And so this is another graphic and actually you can get them as um, gifts too. Um, this thing kind of expands and comes back together. So you can use a gift or you can make a Facebook story. But here's a slightly longer, same type of thing though. All voters should have the freedom to vote equally, which is our, you know, our value. But a handful of politicians want to put up barriers to silence our voices based on what we look like or where we live. That's calling out the villain and calling out the racism. Together, we can ensure that everyone has the freedom to vote and the results of our election reflect the will of the people. Hashtag Truth Brigade, Truth Brigade Illinois. So that's a great, that's a great Facebook example. And when you see these, um, if like we put them in the Truth Brigade group, which is a private uh, group, you can just cut and paste them. You can copy them and put them in your own. No, you know, if you want to personalize it, that's great. If you want to work wordsmith it, but you can simply take other people's stuff and post it. And, and as she said, repetition, repetition, repetition. And um, somebody put in the comments earlier, they said, you know, do we think we're above um, telling people to just repeat things that is too simplistic? And I think that we don't, sometimes I think we, we're too wrapped up in the intellectual analysis of, well, I said it once, how many times do I need to say it? But I think and that's a classic example of, you go for the emotion and you keep on repeating it. Um, so um, Candace, um, what a uh, time is slipping by. So I wanna make sure we're clear on what we want people to do, what we're asking people to do. So. Yeah. We're going to send out these slides so you can look at these other examples. I'm going to jump right past them, but we've got some we've got some examples here. We're going to send the slides to all of you. But yeah, uh, Ed is right. We better let's focus on what you what we can do right now. Um, and Ed is going to put these links in the chat. We're going to send you the chat. We'll send you these slides, um, so you'll have an opportunity. You don't need to be you don't need to even think about writing down these links. Um, but what there's lots of documents and lots of things out there to help you. We've got we've created a Welcome to Truth Brigade Illinois document that will will provide to you, or you can find it on our uh, Facebook page. There is actually a Truth Brigade Illinois uh, membership list, 
And that I, we email people the information. So if you're not on Facebook and you don't ever want to be on Facebook, you can still get our information. And by the way, passing on this information in other formats, um, person to person, email, that also helps spread the truth. So don't think that you have to be on Facebook or um, on Twitter to spread the truth. So you can just join the Truth Brigade Illinois and we will continue to email you and tell you about meetings. Um, we have a meeting of the Truth Brigade Illinois on February 1st, and there's a link to register for that meeting. Um, there's also the Facebook group that we talked about, which is a closed group where we share all the information we get from a Knotts group and other places and from Indivisible National. And we share examples of what we do and we um, help each other out forming true sandwiches. Well, uh, Candace, uh, we can also encourage people to join the Indivisible uh, National. That's Truth the next slide. There you go. Um, right. Indivisible National Truth Brigade is great. They have meetings. Um, every two weeks, they'll roll out a new campaign once a month. Then there's all sorts of support on the next meeting. There's a Slack channel for that group. And I know some people aren't crazy about Slack, but it's a great way to communicate. But even if you're not on Slack, you can still attend those meetings and get the information in your email. Um, so that's a great thing to do. They're a great resource. We, we take their material and share it all the time, but going directly to the source is a great thing to do. Um, well, Candace, you know, I just I just put in the, the chat the link to the very brand new campaign that was put out earlier this evening from Indivisible um, National Truth Brigade. And uh, I, I'm going to recommend if people want to get more of an idea of how to put this truth sandwich together, um, click on that document and look at it and see if you can make a sandwich. And, you know, you can use it in terms of how you're talking to people as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, speaking of talking, we're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, thinking about talking too. And, you know, this is actually pretty scary to me. Um, and well, so we hope you get involved with um, Truth Brigade. But there's another thing happening that you may want to find out about it, and that might be something that you want to do too. And so I'm going to be introducing Ro Rosie Reese, who is actually one of the founding members of Indivisible uh, Evanston. She's a former um, or retired attorney. She also was uh, um, a school board member. That's something I just learned tonight. Um, and uh, she is actively participating in what's called the Talk Radio Project. And I find this really fascinating and really scary, but one of the ways besides social media that disinformation gets passed around, it's through conservative talk shows on the radio. So Rosie, I'd love to hear about what you're doing with that. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right, uh, let me share my screen. Uh oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. I think you have to make me a host, uh, co host again. Sorry. Let me know when you're ready. We're having screen sharing problems tonight. Can you find me under R? <laughs> You're on. Am I on now? I can't hear you, Candace. Rosary. I'm sorry, I'm talking to myself. Okay. Um, hold on. So you can't you you can't screen share? Okay. No. All right. So she hold needs on. to make made it a co-host. So uh, Rosie, how, how long have you been involved with the talk radio project? Yeah, uh, this project started in spring of 2021. Oh, okay, uh, it's new. Yeah, several um, professionals in um, the uh, media arena, radio arena, uh, realized that uh, they had the wherewithal and the expertise to maybe uh, talk back to conservative talk radio. 
And so they started this uh, talk radio project for people to actually call into the conservative talk radio shows uh, and to, to tell the truth uh, against the lies that uh, are being spread on talk radio. So I think you can share now. Okay. Maybe. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Can you see that? Oh, no, nope, no, nope, wait. Okay. Now, now, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, as you know, conservative talk radio is a major source of disinformation going out daily to Trump loyalists. For the na past nine months, we've been organizing and learning how to do the job of countering lies with truth on conservative talk radio. And we're now actively recruiting volunteers to get involved. So let me give you a little context about the rise of conservative talk radio. I've got to be, sorry, I'm on two screens, so I'm have to go back and forth. Um, about the rise of conservative talk radio. Conservative talk radio has become the dominant form of talk radio in the United States for two main reasons. One, in 1987, the Reagan administration abolished the Fairness Doctrine because the Fairness Doctrine required holders of radio licenses to provide balanced reporting and give airtime to opposing views, liberal talk shows used to be as common on the radio as conservative ones. But since the abolition of the Fairness Doctrine, conservative talk shows now outnumber progressive talk shows 15 to one. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 also deregulated radio stations. It allows, allowed companies to own more radio stations and for some shows to become nationally syndicated. Before deregulation, radio stations were predominantly owned by local community leaders. Now, 18% are owned by the five largest companies. Today, there are over 1,500 conservative talk radio shows that saturate every corner of rural America. At least 15 million Americans every week turn, tune into the one of the top 15 talk radio programs. According to the Radio Advertising Bureau, 65% of the audience are men and 35% are women. And listenership is overwhelmingly white. Talk radio is not bounded by physical space. It can follow listeners wherever they go from the car radio while commuting to the radio resting on the workbench to a radio app on a smartphone. If you visit a carpentry shop or factory floor or hitch a ride with a long haul truck driver, odds are you'll be listening to conservative talk radio. And talk radio fans have outsized influence on the political landscape because of their ideological commitment. So we've decided to bring a progressive voice to talk radio. We do this by calling and texting into conservative talk radio shows and we present the progressive point of view. So what do we do? We meet once a week to strategize our calls and texts for the following week. We decide what radio stations we're going to call into and what our messages should be. We also debrief. We listen to recordings of our calls made in the prior week and the reactions of the hosts and the listeners to our messages. And we give feedback to our volunteers so we can continue to improve. Then during the following week, we call and text into at least one show. We'll provide you with a list of conservative talk radio shows to pick from. We'll also give you a script you can use or you can write your own script. We provide you with links to information to back up the script if you need more talking points. So I'm sure you're wondering how much time this takes. On average, you'll spend around two hours a week. That's less than the time than you would spend in an afternoon of canvassing or attending a postcard party. Our weekly Zoom meeting lasts no more than one hour. Then during the following week, you'll spend an average of an hour to listen to the talk radio show and make your call or send in a relevant text. We support our volunteers by providing training. One of our co-leaders will train you on best practices for calling into conservative talk radio. We provide research on issues. We have members who enjoy doing research on issues and can help you get in-depth information on a topic. We find radio stations that can take calls and texts. We listen to stations across the country to find out which stations take listener calls and texts. We provide scripts or help in writing scripts for your calls. So how do you get started? All you need to do is send us an application to tell us about yourself. 
Uh, I don't know, Candice, if you had an opportunity to put the application link into the chat, but if you can do that, that would be great. I just did, it's there. I just, it's and, there. Uh, then we'll do a short interview to get to know you and to answer any questions. Uh, the interview in part is to make sure that you're on our side and not an interloper from the other side. If you decide to join us, we'll give you a 30 minute training session. And if you have questions, you can email, email us at the uh, email address that um, Candace also put into the chat. So let's listen to a couple recent calls that our members have made. This first recording is a call into Andrew Wilkow, a host of a nationally syndicated talk show in response to his tirade that Biden is a weak president. Can you hear that? Hey, Andrew, how are you? Fine, how are you? funny uh, that he didn't quite know what to say to me <laughs> and so he decided that it was a comedy routine and uh, he hung up on me uh, so you know this is a, an example of getting in making your statement and getting out and uh, that's what we we're able to do on that one the next one um, is a conversation with a host of a West Virginia conservative talk show Julie, thanks for waiting. What's on your mind? Hey, Hoppy. I am so glad you've been focusing your show on the For the People Act. It's great to have a discussion about all points of view on this bill. I heard you talking today about ballot harvesting yes. and read your blog yesterday about it. Uh, and I agree with you, Sheriff Bowman. What he did back a few years ago was awful. Uh, and we shouldn't have any laws that allow an official to watch people vote to help them fill in ballots. I mean, that's just intimidation. And that's what preventing ballot harvesting is all about. But you know, there are many states that permit other people to collect ballots for voters, right. like people who are in the hospital or have disabilities, as long as the ballots are sealed and signed by the voter before they're collected. That way, no one can see how the voter voted, no one can fill in the ballots for them, and no one can intimidate them. Now, the For the People Act doesn't say that people can't, that states can't put those kinds of rules in place, that the only ballots you can collect are those that have already been sealed and signed by the voter. You were also mentioning in your blog. Well, let's, about talk about, hey, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that because the okay. laws, the laws, the, the proposal says a state shall permit a voter to designate any person to return a voted and sealed absentee ballot to return. So that it, that to me suggests, okay, you're returning it, but does it say that you can't that you weren't a part of that? That you didn't participate. Now you're not supposed to. I get that. Here's the thing. I, 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 I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to agree with you to a point where where it would be yeah. it would be in, in a perfect world. And I'm going to trust you, Julie. You would say, you know what? I'm going to do my 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 uh, democratic responsibility of a small D. I'm going to go to the nursing home. I'm going to collect these ballots uh, and I'm going to drop them off. And so you do the right thing. But to me, this opens up the opportunity for nefarious characters of any political party or any candidate to harvest and handle those ballots. Doesn't that worry you? But what is what 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 would worry me is any law like in Wisconsin, uh, where they say that somebody actually has to watch somebody fill in the ballot and sign it. Now that worries me because that's exactly what Sheriff Bowman was doing, right? Watching people fill in ballots. Right. It doesn't worry me that the ballot, once the ballot is sealed and signed, the person has voted on their own, and then someone just comes and picks them up for them and brings them to the polling place, that doesn't bother me. 
who went on for a little while after that. Uh, but it was encouraging for me as the caller uh, to get him to agree with me several times while I was um, you know, giving my message to him. The last one um, is a call into a show called Steam Release, where the host just listens and doesn't respond at all. So hold on, I'll get that. Take me a couple more minutes here. Let's see. Uh, Leslie, hi, Leslie. What's your steam? Hi, Javi. I love your show. I listen on the internet, but I wanted to hear your thoughts about this. Now, they recently passed the John Lewis Act. Now they're about to revisit that for the People Act again. And I've heard uh, Mr. McConnell and even Senator Manchin talk about the For the People Act, saying it's going to federalize elections. Now, I want to know your opinion, because to me, that seems like a pretty good idea. Make one standard for every federal election, and that way we don't have to worry about the processes between Pennsylvania or Georgia and Wisconsin. And plus, I've heard the bill makes rich politicians disclose their donors. And I'd like to know who wants to pay for my congressman, wouldn't you? Steam release. So those are three examples of calls we recently made. Uh, as you can see, we're not professional callers. We're not professional uh, radio speakers. We're ordinary people uh, who call in with our points of view. And we try to do with it what Anat has suggested and be positive and send the message that we want people to hear and to repeat it often enough so that uh, that is what they're hearing and not just hearing the lies that the conservative talk radio show hosts will uh, be giving them. So I hope um, you will consider joining us. There is the information in the chat and just reach out to us if you have any questions. So thank you. Rosie, thank, thank you. You, you thank are giving many, many favorable comments. If I were you, I would just uh, capture all that and frame them. You <laughs> now have the Rosie fan club. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Um, I think we've got time for a few questions. If people have questions for Rosie or for um, Etta or I. Um, I did note somebody asking me about changing our names. <laughs> um, and, you know, we do uh, try to have, you know, at some point we try to fight fire with fire. Um, you know, they're always saying that the Democrats are too nice, the Democrats, you know, I think they always have to do everything absolutely right. Um, and at some point, the only way we're going to get on to these stations, um, you know, I kind of changed the, uh, the accent that I use if I'm calling into West Virginia. I don't sound like myself. I sound like someone who was calling from rural West Virginia. Um, and I, I use a name that, uh, you know, uh, sounds like I'm from that part of the country. Uh, and at some point, like I said, we have to start using, uh, you know, fighting fire with fire. So that's one reason that we do that. But, Rosie, I had a question somebody asked me to ask you. If um, Do the radio shows have screeners who ask them to summarize what you're going to be said, what you're going to say prior to being put on the air? Yeah, our experience is that they all they really ask about is your name and where you're from. And that's another reason why when we call into West Virginia, I don't say I'm calling from Evanston, Illinois. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and when I say that I'm from Charleston, Virginia, they let me on the air. Uh, and once in a while, they may say, what are you, gonna, uh, what are you calling in about? And um, I've never been turned down. I, that, I tell the truth about that. Um, and I've never been turned down. And I don't think anybody of our volunteers has been turned down either. That's I see Sarah on the, on the um, call here. So Sarah, if you have anything else to add, because Sarah has been a great volunteer and very, very active with us as well. No, I just really admire Rosie and her perseverance with this, with this. And I encourage anyone it's it's who is interested to join because it really is a good feeling when you're countering all, all of the misinformation and you get on and you get a good piece of information out to those listeners. So um, we need more help. There, there's so much misinformation out there and a small group of us simply can't do all the work by ourselves. And frankly, it's very therapeutic. <laughs> it is. Rather than just screaming at the at uh, you know your computer, you can actually scream at people who are listening. <laughs> um, I also saw somebody um, ask if they uh, screen you out because of your area code. You know, nowadays people with their cell phones they move all across the country with a, a area code that is from their you know the 
the third to the last place that they lived. So um, the area code doesn't seem to be any hindrance at all. I think it's really important the work that you do here because some of these people probably have never heard the other side of this issue at all. So you're probably providing a perspective that they may never just have, have even thought about, which is right. why it's really cool. The other thing is that we know that we're being heard because people call in and respond. Um, you know, many of them are negative, which is okay, because from my perspective, that means that they've heard what we're saying. And, uh, you know, when the, when the host will say, oh, you're right, it's great, because not only are they saying that to me, they're saying that to the 40,000 listeners. Um, so every time we can get the host to kind of like, you know, be on our side with something, it's wonderful. And like I said, we know we're being heard because listeners are responding. That's great. Should we wrap up, Rose? Let's do it. That uh, time flew by for me. I want to thank you again, Rosie. Great project. Thanks for leading the talk radio effort. Also, thanks for Sarah. By the way, Sarah is pretty darn good at messaging too. So she's uh, multitasking for us. You are all doing such a really amazing work. You give me hope, most definitely. I want to thank Truth Brigade, Indivisible Evanston, Western Front Indivisible for collaborating with Indivisible Illinois tonight on this uh, terrific event. Thanks to all of our outstanding speakers, Candace, Etta, Anat, Rosie, and grateful to our audience. Of course, you have the power. When your vision is rooted in purpose, provision will come. Just picked that up recently and it really speaks to me. We've uh, accomplished so much, everybody, in uh, 2018 and 2020. We can do it again. Good night, everyone. Thank you.